This is Tuck Alumni Lifelong Learning at its very best. Um, first, I'd like to tell you who I am. I'm Dave Salone, uh, Director of Development and Annual Giving here at Tuck, and uh, would love to just welcome you all back to Tuck, to Hanover, to the Georgiopolis classroom in Rayther Hall. This is a beautiful facility. For those of you who took the tour with Andy Steele a little while ago, you took it all in. And for those of you who didn't, we encourage you to wander around this building after this class when you will have some free time before your class cocktails. And you'll know where your class cocktails are by looking at your card. And it says, right at the, under your name, it says Friday cocktails. And there should be a location there. So at 5.30, all your classmates are going to be going to whatever that location is. Every, every class has a different room. So uh, I encourage you to go back there. It's wonderful for me to see, it's, it's sort of like a trip down memory lane to see lots of faces I know and uh, lots of faces that I hope to get to know um, by the end of this weekend. Um, so this is uh, a great classroom. Our faculty love this space. And we have a terrific faculty member, uh, Associate Dean and Professor Matt Slaughter to speak with us today. It's always, uh, I think, a, it's a great time to, to be able to introduce Matt. I enjoy it because in his short life, he's done so many things that I never have enough time in the introduction uh, time frame to talk all about him. But he's been at Tuck since 2002. Uh, he was at Dartmouth College prior to that, teaching in the economics department. Um, he is uh, associate dean for the MBA program. and. Uh, professor of economics at Tuck. He's got myriad publications out there. I won't talk about them, but you can Google him, and you'll certainly find plenty out there. He has been uh, a consultant and a visiting scholar uh, at places like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the Council on Foreign Relations, McKinsey Global Institute. He served from 2005 to 2007 on the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, in the office of the president. We are absolutely delighted and fortunate to have Matt Slaughter on the faculty at Tuck. Our students love him. Today he's talking about the global economy, prognosis for recovery, and policy changes. And I, in particular, am interested to, to understand why that word prognosis is in there. It has uh, some healthcare twist to it. So um, I would like to welcome Matt Slaughter. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thank you, Dave. That's very kind. And uh, I'll extend my own uh, tuck welcome to everybody. It's great to see familiar faces. And, and welcome back. And hopefully you all uh, uh, will have some good weather and good cheer over the weekend. Um, and so to cheer us all up, we'll talk about the global economy for a little while. Because uh, it's, it's, it's been just a, a barrel of laughs. So I put together a set of slides, but I'm happy for this. And, and as Dave pointed out, we, the faculty and the students, are, th are thrilled to have you all back here, but especially in such this, this lovely new space. This new building is a gorgeous building for the students in terms of their residence uh, and for the learning environment. So if you haven't wandered around, definitely take the time to wander around this lovely new space as part of the new, uh, part of the Tuck footprint. Uh, the classrooms are great. We have lots of functions in here in different ways, and, and including events like this. Um, so I've put together some slides uh, with some numbers and pictures that we could talk about uh, but as I said, I'll emphasize, uh, uh, hopefully this will be a conversation. So we can talk about uh, whatever is on your mind. So just call out or raise your hand if I don't hear you calling out. Um, but there's a few things I thought we'd talk about. And um, I'm going to use the metaphor of, uh, of the uh, animals in the Winnie the Pooh stories. So when people talk about global economics and, and, and market forces, they oftentimes invoke this metaphor of the animal spirits, right? And kind of, kind of what you need for business to grow and economies to grow is you need the animal spirits uh, to be at play. So uh, my wife and I have two boys, and in our family over the many years, uh, the Winnie the Pooh stories have, have been quite popular. Um, so if you don't remember who the Winnie the Pooh characters are, I'll remind us a little bit along the way. But there's this pantheon of different characters who have very different personalities. Um, and I think they're quite apt for understanding some of the forces that are at play and some of the challenges in the global economy right now. Um, so three things I wanted to think a little bit about. One is to talk about kind of where there seems to be some evidence of recovery in the United States and other countries. Um, so in that sense, if, if you recall, Eeyore was the donkey in the Winnie the Pooh stories who oftentimes had a, a rather dour disposition, sometimes intelligently so, but a bit dour. Uh, things are better than they were many months ago, uh, better than they were a year ago, and that's positive. That's great. 
Uh, that said, um, then we're kind of wondering how things might play out. So to see how things might progress in the United States and really the rest of the world, there's a lot of questions that you'd like to have answered, but one of the most important ones is kind of how the United States consumer might uh, progress in terms of how much spending households might do in the United States. So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at that part of the U.S. economy and other parts, related parts of the economy. Um, and there, again, I'll think of, if you recall in the Winnie the Pooh stories, Piglet was a character who sometimes was prone to be a little more nervous, sometimes a little happier disposition, and I think that sense of ambivalence uh, uh, describes a lot of families in the United States and the, and the lack of clarity about how that piece of the U.S. economy is going to change going forward. Um, and now I'm mixing metaphors, I realize, but lots of people then want to gaze into their collective crystal ball and look into the future and know what, how the, the world economy in the U.S. and different markets are going to progress in the coming quarter, two quarters, year, two years. Um, and I'll admit, my, my crystal ball is not especially clear compared to anybody else's. Um, economists are bad at predicting many things. Uh, we're especially bad at, at predicting and understanding the nature of turns in the business cycle. So um, be wary of anyone that comes to you these days who tells you, I know exactly what's going to happen next quarter or next year. Um, they may be right, but that'll be a little bit of dumb luck uh, more than anything else. So here we can think about, um, we'll kind of think about scenarios that might play out. And I'll share some thoughts about my reflections on kind of how the intersection between government and business has been evolving in the past, uh, in the past year uh, in ways that I, I will acknowledge don't always make me uh, feel like Tigger in one of the Pooh stories. Though by disposition and personality, I tend to be like Tigger, very optimistic and outgoing. Um, there's still a lot of challenges that, uh, that the world economy and the U.S. economy face right now. Okay. Um, and as I said, conversation, right? Conversation. So uh, uh, call out comments or questions as we, as we move along, please. Okay? Um, so where can we say, see some signs of recovery? Um, we can talk about lots of countries. I'll focus a little bit more on the United States because in part that's where part of the global recession has been most intense, um, and that's where a lot of us live and work. Uh, so if I look at the United States, um, you know, one of the things that's encouraging is the, the, the implosion and, and the absolute collapse in, in, in activity in residential real estate in homes. Um, that's moderating. Uh, so that is actually, a, that's, a, that's a positive sign. I've got some numbers here. I'll show a picture in a minute. The rate of price decline has, has for the moment at least, leveled off um, for what was, uh, to the extent that we can measure these things in the history of the United States, the, most, the biggest real estate bubble the United States has ever seen and one of the biggest uh, uh, asset market bubbles kind of the world seen in any asset class. Um, part of what happened as home prices were collapsing was in the real economy, people stopped building new homes, not surprisingly. So peak to trough, the number I have up here, the rate of new home starts uh, from its peak in early 06 to the trough earlier this year, uh, the rate of home starts collapsed by 78.2%. So uh, thank goodness that the whole economy wasn't like residential real estate, because if it were, we would have had a depression about four times as bad as the Great Depression. Uh, but that seems to be moderating. So that's, that's one of these positive signs that people are looking at. Um, importantly, uh, uh, for lots of reasons, and especially if we're going to think about the consumer, we need to know how, um, how the labor market's doing. Uh, the labor market, as I'll spend some time talking about, is um, it's better in the sense that it's not getting as bad at, a, at as, as dramatic of a rate. I think is the right way to look at it. So if you like, if you like the math, we're thinking about second derivatives here a little bit. Um, so the unemployment rate in the United States is a little bit under 10% right now. Um, the num total number of payroll jobs uh, since this recession started in the US has fallen by about 8 million. Uh, uh, and, and we'll talk about underemployment. There's, a, there's broader measures of weakness in the, in the US labor market. That's part of what still has to be worked through in some basic sense. The good thing, though, uh, is there's definitely a, a moderation in, in that rate of decline in the U.S. labor market compared to where it was earlier this year. The early months in 2009, the rates of job decline and, 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 and other measures of, of the worsening of the labor market were pretty dramatic. So that's good. Um, and so, you know, in calendar time, this has been a very lengthy recession. Uh, but Chairman Bernanke at the, at the Fed, at the Federal Reserve, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, he was at a conference in Washington, D.C., and on the record said that he thinks the recession is, quote, very likely over at this point. Um, now, you know, not even Chairman Bernanke and his colleagues at the Fed know. In the United States, for what it's worth, uh, there's an organization called the NBER that some folks at Tuck, like me and Ken French, are part of. There's a small committee at the Bureau. They're the ones that date the beginning and ending of business cycles. Uh, but it seems like, given that um, 
these, these improvements we're talking about here, and given that, if anything, output it looks like might be growing now in the third quarter slightly, that combination of moderation is what gets a lot of people saying, it looks like the, the recession may be over, and, and that's great. And then the question is, okay, what, what's the prognosis going forward? Okay? Um, uh, uh, here's a picture of sort of these animal spirits at play in residential real estate. Uh, so this is a picture. I made it as big as I could. Uh, you don't really need to see the numbers in detail to get the message. Uh, this is uh, some measures of home prices in the United States for one of these common indexes that people talk about in the press. If you know this index, it's the Case-Shiller Price Index. It's a pretty good one, actually. Uh, so on the vertical axis is an index. It's not dollars. It's an index. Up is higher home prices. Going all the way back from uh, 1987, when uh, this index started, through to the most recent month of data that we still have, which is Jul July of this year. Um, and there's two national averages. The yellow line is a 10-city average. The green line, which doesn't start until 2000, is a 20-city average. Uh, so that's some measure of national home prices, if you will. There's lots of regional variation, as the, the crisis has shown. So I showed a couple of different uh, uh, markets that Case Shiller tracks. Close to home for uh, those of us that talk, here's in dark blue is Boston. That's the Boston metropolitan area. And then red is one of the more uh, bubbly US markets. That's San Diego. So you can see. Um, before this crisis, one of the biggest kind of run-ups and downturns in, in real estate in the U.S. actually occurred in the late 80s and early 90s. You can see that here. Here's the run-up in home prices and the downturn. So peak to trough in the Boston area, for example, it took about kind of four to five years for, uh, for things to moderate and then slowly start to increase again. But here's this tiggerish period in the United States where over much of the 2000s, up until nationally, home prices has peaked in... Uh, May of 2006, you had this dramatic run up in home prices in the United States. And then you see this, uh, this uh, switch of the bubble bursting and kind of going from Tigger to Eeyore in terms of this dramatic decline in home prices. And now, in the past few months, we see what I've called this piglet type period of, OK, that, that collapse in home prices is moderated at least for a little period of time. Um, and this is one of the things nobody quite knows how things might play out right now. Um, so yeah, I kind of feel like that. Um, you know, I, one of the uncertainties is, is the, the, the degrees in which the federal government is still playing a very extensive role in the residential real estate industry in the United States, both in terms of directly financing mortgages for some, uh, some home buyers, uh, guaranteeing the flow of new mortgages, like 85 to 90 percent of, of, of the stock of new mortgages coming out in recent months are guaranteed by the government, uh, new home buyer tax credits the discussion about some sort of reworking of, of foreclosures led a lot of private banks to hold back in recent months on bringing, bringing units into the foreclosure market and into distressed resale. Um, so um, it's, we don't quite know kind of what will happen uh, here. The, the prices, you know, they're back to kind of where they were in nominal terms to uh, kind of 2002, roughly. Um, and kind of how that plays out from, from here remains to be seen. And, and part, of, part of the challenge in understanding this is uh, how households react to this, OK? Because a big question mark is how, for the, for the typical American household, the single biggest asset they have on their, on their personal balance sheet is the equity that they hold in their, re, in their primary residence, in their house. OK? And so I'll show us some numbers in a minute about what's happened to the value of residential real estate. And part of the question for growth and, and jobs is, is kind of, how people are, are, are looking at this change and how that's affecting their consumption habits. Okay? Um, so where might the business cycle turn? Um, those of you, I see some faces at least, that uh, in class I had in GEM and Global Economics for Managers, so I'm sure that if I you know, had fed, threw a knee right here and had to be taken to the hospital, some of you could step up and remind everybody of the big four pieces of aggregate demand that determine business cycles, right? So when you've got business cycles, it's because you've got these fluctuations in aggregate demand in the economy that falls below supply. So if you want to know where the business cycle turns, you've got to tell me a story about these different components of aggregate demand, right? So it's consumption demand. It's capital investment demand. So let me go one by one. Consumption demand is, is the purchases of goods and services by families, by households, OK? Um, this really matters for the United States because it's 70.1% of total output, total gross domestic product last year. So I think a lot of you might have heard over the many years these mixed metaphors of the US consumer is the engine of growth, or the, it's the conductor of the train, or whatever. 
Um, that's really true in the statistics. In the United States, consumption is 70% of all economic activity in terms of all the demand. So if you tell me a narrative for what's going to happen with consumption demand, I've got a narrative that tells me 70% of the overall economy. Okay? Um, and that's very high. It's very high relative to earlier periods in the United States. So if I look at the post-World War II uh, couple of generations from around 1945 to uh, the early 1980s, consumption as a, as a share of GDP was about 60%. And then what happened over the past kind of 25 plus years is households uh, started saving less and less out of their incomes and they started consuming more and more out of their incomes. So consumption rising from about 60% of GDP to 70% of GDP, the flip side of that was a fall in savings rates by households. Um, from that couple of generations, end of World War II to the, about the early 80s, if you took American households and you added up, um, took all their income from all their sources, subtract off what they paid to Uncle Sam in taxes, so what's left over is their after tax or their disposable income. Um, on average, American households over that period, they saved about 10% or a dime out of every dollar of after tax income. It fluctuated a bit here and there over the years, but that was a, a pretty rough number. And then for a set of reasons we don't fully understand, but we could talk about, um, Households started dissaving. They stopped saving as much out of their incomes. So that before the crisis hit in the recession, if you looked at the data for 05, 06, 07, uh, uh, the disposable sa income savings rate of, of American households had fallen to just over 1%, a little over a penny out of the dollar. So, and we're really high compared to most other countries in the world. Uh, China today, consumption as a share of GDP is about 35%. The savings rates of Chinese households today average about 25 to 30 percent, where the average income in China, you know, average income per person in China last year was about $3,200, out of which the typical household saved 25 to 30 percent. Um, so if I want to know what the business cycle is going to do, I definitely want, uh, I want to have some guess about what's going to happen with consumption. I'd like to know something about capital investment. There's two big pieces here. That's business investment in property, plant, and equipment. So the Tuck School's investment in this lovely building and, and this desk and my laptop, that's capital investment. Building homes, that's part of capital investment in the, in the accounts that our country and other countries keep. That's residential investment. As, we've, as I've talked about, that's been contracting dramatically as a share of output. But investment in the United States is about 15% of GDP. Um, point of contrast, in China last year, investment as a share of GDP was about 45%. Uh, and again, capital investment is how, just like individuals or businesses, that's how a country builds up its productive capacity for the future and its, its debt repayment capacity, which we'll come back to. Um, I want to know something about exports. So some of the stuff that we produce is demanded not by other actors in the United States, but it's demanded by the rest of the world. Uh, for the U.S., that's about 13% of GDP. So I want to know, are we doing things on the policy front to try to liberalize trade and investment and immigration, the kind of linkages that allow trade flows to grow? We'll come back to that. Uh, and then the wild card here is what the government does, because the government is part of demand as well. So those are the four big sources of aggregate demand for any country. It's what households spend in consumption, capital investment by companies, exports to the rest of the world, and government demand. And those things added up, if you subtract off imports then, that gets you 100%. Right? And all of you who took GEM, that's great. I know this is boring, because you remember that in great detail. Um, so. It, it, trying to understand kind of how the economy is going to go is, is trying to tell a narrative and then link these stories together for these different parts of the economy, right? Um, if you look at the data for, for recent quarters, you can kind of get a sense for how we got, how the recession played out by looking at uh, declines in these components of aggregate demand. So I'm just going to click through for the, uh, the four quarters of 2008 and then the first two quarters of 2009 that we have data on. Uh, those different uh, components of aggregate demand that we were just talking about. So these are all annualized rates of change. So remember, the recession was dated as starting at, uh, in December of 2007. So in the first three months of 2008, real GDP, uh, real output of all the stuff in the U.S. economy, was contracting at an annualized rate of 7 tenths of 1%. So these numbers are all annualized. Uh, so why was output falling? It was partly because consumption demand was falling. You can see that was falling at an annualized rate of 6 tenths of 1%. Companies were still expanding their capital stock a little bit in the first few months of 2008. 
you can see that already by, you know, we were well underway with this dramatic contraction in home building. Residential investment was contracting at an annualized rate of 28 uh, percent already in the first quarter of last year. Um, and trade flows were shrinking a little bit. Uh, second quarter, uh, even though technically we were still in a recession, the, in those three months, the rate of output was growing a little bit in an annualized rate of about 1.5 percent. Uh, the rate of home building moderated uh, in terms of how the, the decline there. Exports grew a bit. Um, and even back then, a lot of people, because the, 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 again, the arbiters of the NBER, they hadn't yet called a recession. Some people were saying, well, geez, maybe you know, the US economy and the world economy is kind of turning a corner at this point. Um, we'd had the blow up of Bear Stearns at that point, right? That happened in March. Uh, there was still some stress in global capital markets. Nobody was quite sure what was going to happen. Um, then we got into the third quarter. At the end of the third quarter in September of last year, right? That's when Lehman filed for bankruptcy. That's when AIG almost uh, went under. Uh, Fannie and Freddie were taken over by the federal government. And that's when you had this dramatic escalation of the crisis in, in capital markets. So I think of the capital markets crisis as sort of contributing to the recession, but also being aggravated by the recession in different ways. So causation, I think, between the chaos in capital markets and the real economy, causation kind of runs in both directions. Um, but what we saw here, even then, was then a lot of companies starting to pull back on their capex as they weren't quite sure what was happening. And boy, when you moved into the fourth quarter of, of last calendar year, and the first quarter of this year, in 2009, that was the really dramatic uh, rate of contraction that I was talking about a little while ago. So you saw it, the annualized rate of decline of GDP got up to 5.5%, 6, 6.4%. Uh, notice the collapse in, collapse in business investment. Right? First three months of this year, companies were cutting back on their CapEx uh, budgets by an annualized rate of 39.2%. Um, and I'm sure some of you saw this or were making these choices, but the companies I work with and interact with, boy, it was this time of real uncertainty, and they were just postponing and cutting back lots of different programs. And notice that uh, the exports and import uh, numbers, this has been a global phenomenon, as we'll come to in a few minutes here. It has not just been the United States, but many other countries, there's been this dramatic pressure from capital markets and, and pressure from uncertainty, so trade flows around the world have contracted a lot. Um, and the second quarter, again, this is part of the relatively optimistic part, you know, things are, the rate of, of, of decline is moderating. So in the second quarter of 2009, that's through June, a, a few months ago, output was shrinking at, at, at a much slower rate, only seven tenths of one percent. The rate of CapEx declined by businesses moderated a lot. Uh, and so now there's a sense, and notice the trade flow numbers, trade was not contracting as much in the second quarter, the sense of moderation and the hope that maybe things will stabilize and, and, and start to grow a bit. Right? Um, and notice that last line, the very last number there, the, uh, we, see, we start to see the impact of the fiscal stimulus there. Right? So in the United States, our $787 billion American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, you see part of that is start an increase in, in spending at the federal level, but also at, at state levels, too, because of lots of the stimulus at the federal level was cutting checks to state and local governments to increase their spending. So you see some of that uh, right here. We'll come back to that. Um, and we got any questions at this point? OK. Um, so. Again, if I, want to, if I want to try to understand the different, you know, different parts of the economy and whether it's going to be more like Eeyore, whether it's going to hopefully move into something more like Pooh or Piglet or you know, parts of the economy even feeling like Tigger, um, I want to understand the, the, the spending choices of families, of businesses, of the rest of the world, of government. So let's spend a minute on each of those. Uh, but again, I really want to start with households and consumption choices because that's 70% of total aggregate demand. Yep, please. Uh, great question. So how deep would the fall in GDP have to be to be a depression? You know, uh, there's no kind of textbook definition of what a depression is, uh, meaning kind of we had one, it was really big, so we called it great. Uh, peak to trough, I've got some slides to compare this with uh, uh, the, the, de the decline in activity in the world during the depression in, in the late 20s and early 30s. But just to put in perspective, uh, peak to trough, kind of 29 to early 33 in the United States, GDP fell in total by about 20%. So you know, we're, we're nowhere near that in terms of the decline in GDP. Unemployment got up to about 25% uh, during the trough of the Great Depression. And again, 
No, but even around the world, there's not a standard definition of recession. So the US definition of recession, not to be tautological, it's what seven economists on the NBER Business Cycle Dating Committee said as it is. Um, the sort of rule of thumb definition of a recession is at least two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. So different countries sort of have different standards for how they even define uh, recessions. Um, so let's spend a minute thinking about households. The spending decisions of households are driven by two big things, and some other things, but kind of two big ones. That people are pretty sophisticated in terms of understanding their pocketbooks. So it depends on their income statements and on their balance sheets. And for most households, if you look at their income statements, they get the majority to all of their income to spend consumption on from how they're doing in the labor market. Um, you know, some people have assets that generate the income that the people can use to spend. For most households, that's small to zero part of their, their flow of income uh, out of which they can make consumption versus savings decisions. So if I want to know consumption in the aggregate, I want to know how the labor market's doing. Um, now again, the, the rate of moderation in the labor market is there. It's, it's not deteriorating as badly as it was, um, but I've got some words and numbers here. You know, the, the performance of the US labor market is still under a lot of stress. And, and I wish it were different, but that's just how it is. Um, our government tracks something called underemployment above and beyond unemployment. Underemployment includes people who um, uh, are so discouraged at inability to find work that they've dropped out of the labor force, and also people who do have a job, but they're working part-time hours only, even though they say, I would love to work full-time if I could get full-time hours, but my employer won't give it to me. Um, the rate of underemployment last month uh, reached 17%. So it's a little over one in six people in the labor force. So the total number of underemployed workers in the US right now is about 26.2 million. Um, part of why unemployment candidly hasn't risen as much thus far is you've got a lot of people who are exiting the labor force. So if you're a working age adult, but you, if you're surveyed by the government every month they do this, and you say, I'm not actually actively looking for work, um, even if you kind of in the back of your mind like to have a job, you're counted as out of the labor force. And last month, 571,000 people left the labor force. Um, the number of hours people are working is, uh, average number of working hours is 33. Um, our government's been collecting that statistic since 1964. This is the lowest it's ever been. Um, that average spell of unemployment, if you fall into unemployment right now, your expected time in unemployment is a little over six months. That's as high as it's been and the time it's been collected. And this other, this other statistic here that I've highlighted at the bottom, I'm going to come back to. Um, there's fewer private sector jobs in the US today than there were 10 years ago. So if we think about how we're going to get growth, for me, in my mind, if, if it, this is, if, I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you, uh, but um, this is one worth keeping in the back of your minds, which is how we're going to get companies to grow jobs. That's actually, in my mind, one of the biggest policy challenges right now. And a lot of other issues that people talk about they're important in my mind insofar as they're going to affect this number. Um, because the data are quite clear it, it, that income growth for families and for communities and, and for the country overall comes from the private sector mainly. So the question is, what is it going to take to induce private sector companies to go out and hire more people? Um, and it's companies across the size distribution. It's what's it going to take to, to incent a lot more startups and small companies to get going and really to start to grow? And at the other end of the distribution, what's it going to take to get very large, globally engaged companies uh, to, to hire more people? Because those are the companies that, that, especially the ones that are uh, in exporting and importing, or that are part of a multinational company, and the companies that many of us have been in or are in, boy, it's clear in the data. They tend to be more capital intensive, trade intensive, R&D intensive. Those companies do more knowledge creation. And it shows up in paychecks. They pay much higher average compensation than the rest of the private sector does, 25 30%. So in my mind, one of the biggest policy questions is how we try to get companies hiring more people. And I'll kind of come back to that when we talk about some of, the, some of the intersections between government and business that I don't think is necessarily incenting companies to go out and hire a lot of people right now. We'll come back to that. Um, and the other thing is incomes. You know, recessions tend to put pressure on family incomes. And average family incomes fell a lot last year, in, in part because of the recession. Uh, they fell by about 3.6%. And average, the median income of a household in the United States last year was $50,303. And these are all inflation adjusted. Uh, that was a, a $992 lower than where it was a decade ago. 
So that's kind of, you know, the, this, again, this is not the depression on the question earlier because as, as difficult and, and, and as this is for lots of people and families, you know, it, uh, um, this is not the, the magnitude of the, of the, of the pressure and, and, and pain that was there from the depression, but this is, this is very real and very pervasive. And it, and it shows kind of that this recession uh, it was, it has been a, a severe one, right? In many ways, the, the most severe that we've had in, the, in our country, at least, since the Great Depression. Um, so there's pressure on a lot of incomes. Um, it's not evenly shared across the population. Candidly, the pressure's uh, harder at the lower end of the income distribution and the, and the skills distribution. So if you adjust again for inflation, so you got real earnings, uh, the broadest measure of, of compensation our government collects where I can uh, categorize people by their educational attainment is something called money income, total money income. It's about 82% of total compensation paid in the, in the United States economy. It's missing that 18% of non-monetary comp that, that's things like health care benefits, stock option grants, those types of things. Um, so we can kind of look at the skill, march up the skills distribution um, and if you, if you think of that, that lovely John Kennedy metaphor of the rising tide lifting all the boats, the rising tide is kind of economic growth, and the lifting of all the boats is this notion of, of incomes growing for lots of people. Um, you know, that, that has not been happening uh, in a way that, that's pressuring a lot of families. So start at the bottom, here's people with less than a high school degree. That was 9.1% of workers uh, in, in 2008, and on average, for those, those, those folks in the U.S. labor force with less than a high school degree, their earnings from 2000 through 2008 uh, fell by 9.1%. That's not every, every high school dropout, but that's an average, right? Some did better, some did, a, you know, held their own, some did worse. That's the average. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a boat that's not being lifted. Um, here's high school graduates. 28% of, 0.8% uh, of workers, uh, an average earnings change of a decline of 3.9%. Here's some college, with or without a two-year associate degree, a decline of 7.8%. Notice if you're adding up, I've crossed through the, the, the median worker in the labor force. I've got more than half the workers in the U.S. labor force. I've got the median voter, and that's important when we think about some of the policy choices. And if it, I'm gonna make, I got a slide on this later. Remember that the, um, all the to-do about the AIG bonuses in March and the congressional hearings? In my mind, that's very correlated with this picture and why a lot of people looked at that and said, yeah, that feels about right. Um, keep going. And, and again, the, part, of, uh, part of what's challenging about our current environment is for a lot of decades up until where we are in the past several years, it was college graduates and above whose real earnings were rising quite well. Um, it's not quite that clear now. So college graduates, 21.8%, average earnings change of a decline of 5.6%. That's just a four-year degree without any advanced degree. Uh, so keep going, master's degrees, master's in public policy, master's in social work, master's in education, those non-professional master's degrees. 8.9% uh, of workers, a decline of 7%. Uh, who's left? So we got the PhDs. Uh, don't worry, we're right there with you. 1.6% uh, <laughs> of workers in earnings change uh, of a decline of 2.2%. So who's left? The Professional degrees are the doctors and the lawyers and the MBAs, and that's the slice of the, of the skills distribution whose earnings on average have gone up, right? <laughs> Clearly a reflection of your hard work at Tux, so well done you. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I admit, I wish this were different, and, 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 but it's, it's something that shows up in lots of statistics depending on how you measure income and how you categorize workers. Yeah. Um, not off my head, I can't write off the medians here, but I know if I looked at median changes rather than means, qualitatively it's the same. It's negative, 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 negative and then plus. Yep. Yep. Great question. Um, it, this number qualitatively is not sensitive to the starting and end year. Like, I like, so most economists want, kind of want to look to peak to peak. So I'd want to look 2000 to 2007. It was the same picture a year ago. It was the same picture uh, through 06, 05. So this is a trend that's kind of been there for quite some time. So, I, yeah, sorry. No. Oh, 
Oh, in terms of which types of workers yeah. on the supply side? Yeah, so what's creeping up over time, so the, sh uh, the skills composition in the U.S. labor force is increasing over time. So the share of high school dropouts is ticking down year on year by kind of one, two tenths of a percent. Folks at the high end are ticking up. The, the advanced degrees and the PhDs are ticking up year on year by a tenth or two tenths. Um, so we can come back to that in terms of it, in levels. It's still the case that relative to many countries around the world, by no means all, by many, we're still a very educated country on average. Um, but that, the size of that gap, uh, bless you, has been falling a lot. Uh, and that's something that um, we can think about. Right? Yep, please. Great question. So two things, right? One is how are people's balance sheets doing? So we're going to look at balance sheets next. And then also it's access to credit. Those are the th that's the kind of the trifecta of forces for any household in terms of how they think about, gosh, how much can I go out and spend today? You know, and underlying that then is kind of their preferences as well. So we can think about the, 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 it, whether the preferences of Americans have changed. And in some sense, in recent years or decades, Americans have become more impatient and, and more, you know, Put in whatever adjective you want here that they feel like they should go out and be able to consume more today. Okay? So just the borrowing has increased the level of consumption. Yeah, so part of this, this is per worker. So part of the adjustment for households is um, going from uh, one worker households to two worker households. So mom or dad might have not been in the labor force but joins the labor force. To the extent that there was before the deep recession now, the margin of I could work more hours, people work more hours inside the household. So for a household, it's the combination of per worker income, how many people are in the labor force in the household, how many hours they work. Then we'll click in a minute to the balance sheets and we can talk about access to credit too. Yep, and there was a hand here, sorry. Yeah, so all this is real. So I'm deflating all the nominal dollars by the consumer pr a measure of the consumer price index. Right. So in principle, these are kind of inflation adjusted. This isn't just changes because of something about uh, price inflation. Right. Yep. Yep. So Michael Mandel from Business Week came and talked to the students of the Tuck community a couple weeks ago. So go ahead. No, uh, so it's a great question. I don't want f to sidetrack us because um, a lot of people weren't here. Two things. One is Michael was measuring a much longer time period. And the second is you still see that here is in relative terms, the high school graduates did better than many other cohorts in terms of the change since 2000. Right? Um, not to say in levels, you're still not better off if you can have a college degree all is equal than having just a high school degree. You still, on average, have much higher earnings. But you know, what, what was true for a long time was you had this trend of rising inequality between college graduates and high school graduates. And since roughly 2000, the lines are now going like this. It's kind of what to think of. Again, different measures give you different, uh, different exact patterns. So let me give you another one. Um, you, we can look at the IRS tax return data. So you can take a look at the tax return data. And I can't see, you don't have to report your educational attainment when you're filing taxes. So I can't break things up by uh, educational attainment. But you can just measure kind of, outcomes in terms of what, what um, the distribution of earnings by the top percentile of earners, the top 10% of earners, how, do it that way in terms of outcomes, because you can't see skills directly. So you can look at what share of gross personal income reported to the IRS was accounted for by the top 1% of tax filers. Um, in 2007, that's the most recent year of IRS data that we have, to be in that top percentile, you had to report to the IRS an adjusted gross income of at least $398,900. Right? That put you in, anybody at or above that level, you're in the top percentile. Uh, in 19, so go back to 1977, uh, that top 1% of earners earned, uh, uh, accounted for 7.9% of all the AGI reported to the IRS. 
Uh, in 2007, it was 23.5 percent. So different measures will give you slightly different indicators, but the message I want us to take away just in general, we think about households and consumption spending is the pressures on income have been especially harder the farther down you go in the skills and earnings distribution. That's been true for a long time. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's the market pre-tax, market outcome of technological change, changing consumer tastes, international trade, international investment. This is kind of what the market's been delivering. Right? And then we can think about whether from a policy perspective you care or whether you, you know, how you might address this. We can, we'll come back to that. Okay? But if I'm trying to understand a story about consumption growth for the US going forward, my message here is if I think about how households' paychecks are doing, it's difficult for me to see a story in the, for quite some time that, wow, consumption growth in the U.S. is going to take off because households' incomes are going to be rising a lot. That's not going to be the case, right? So then we, then, it, then we can think about balance sheets, right, and, and how the balance sheets of American households are doing. Um, they've actually, balance sheets of American households have hit very hard by the global capital markets crisis and by the housing recession, right? So data on this, these are now trillions of dollars. Every quarter, the U.S. Federal Reserve does a guesstimate on what the balance sheets are for households and other sets of actors in the U.S. economy. So the net worth of American households uh, peaked at the end of the third quarter in 2007 at about $64.3 trillion. So sorry, I, I didn't take, uh, uh, this might not pass Professor Stockton's accounting, uh, how I draw a chart, but here we are. Um, so uh, households had, at, at the end of Q3 of 07, about uh, $78 trillion worth of assets total. 21 trillion of which was the value of their homes, the gross value of their homes. They had about 50 trillion dollars in financial assets, that's stocks, corporate bonds, treasuries, the value of their, of their checking accounts. Um, offsetting that, they had about 14 trillion dollars in liabilities. That was about 11 trillion dollars in mortgages. And the other three, roughly, is different forms of revolving credit, mainly credit card debt. And then, then you, know, the, you know, the reality is when, when you have this implosion of residential real estate values and in, and in global, uh, a lot of asset markets, what we've had is this deep contraction in the, in the value of the net worth of American households. So the most recent data we have is for June 30th of this year, the net worth of American households had fallen by about $11 trillion. Um, that's better. Again, that's part of the improvement. At the end of Q1, it had fallen to $51.1 trillion. But as a lot of us know, this, you know, this is now we've got an upturn in equity markets in the U.S. and many other countries. You think about that. Um, but when you look, the Fed's been collecting these data since the end of World War II. Net worth generally trended up for, for generations. Um, and with some squiggles and accelerations. But one of the uncertain things about right now is in the history of the data that we've had since World War II, we've never seen this sharp and dramatic of a fall in the net worth of American households. Um, and so part of the uncertainty then is thinking about how do American households react to this type of shock to their wealth. Yeah? It's a great question, and that, again, that's, that's the, I'll call it the $10 trillion question, because uh, uh, $10 trillion was consumption spending last year, right? So why are savings rates going up in light of that? What is allowing households to increase their savings in 2009? So it's, it's transfer payments from the government is what it is, is allowing this pressure on incomes to be partially offset by, uh, by increases in their income coming from the government. So let me show you numbers on that, okay? So the pressures on, on households' income statements and their balance sheets, for the time being at least, are being offset by very large transfers but from the federal government. So if you look at the data, we, uh, the GDP data that we get quarter by quarter, you can look at the different sources of incomes that households are realizing. So they feel like Piglet, I think, if I can invoke that animal right now for animal spirits, they're a little unsure, a little uneasy, because when they look at sort of what's happening to pre-tax, uh, they're, they're under a lot of pressure. So over the nine months of, the, of Q3 08 through Q2 of 09, um, employee compensation fell by $341 billion. Uh, proprietor's income, that's you know, if you own your own business, an S-corp or something like that, uh, that you pay yourself distributions out of, that fell by $86 billion. 
And again, the deterioration of the balance sheets then, the income flows coming off that, those are down by $228 billion. So that added up is like an income shock to households of 600 and, sorry, I should have added it up, 600 and some billion dollars. Um, but offsetting that are very large uh, fiscal transfers from the federal government. So direct transfer payments, increases in Social Security payments or tax cuts that some individuals have seen, that accounts for $266 billion. And then more broadly, with the downturn in incomes and asset values, the amount that the government requires you to pay into taxes goes down. So that's an implicit transfer as well. And that's to the tune of that is $370 billion. So for households right now, you know, they're looking at their balance sheets and their income statements, and those things are under pressure. You know, and, and again, hopefully this is going to improve, but part of what has to improve it, I think, is we've got to get a little more policy certainty in part so companies start hiring jobs again. Um, and you know, the, the fiscal stimulus, part of what it's doing is it's supporting the income of households to prevent their declines in consumption from being as big. So consumption is actually falling just a little bit, not much. And it's the, it's the surge in, in, um, in income from the federal government that's allowing the savings rates, if you follow this that closely, the savings rates to tick up from 1, 1.5% 1 to like 4%. Now, looking ahead, you know, put all this together, and, and you, you, know, you all can tell me as good of a narrative as anybody we can get from Wall Street to tell us a narrative about this. Um, what's going to happen in consumption spending this year and beyond is sort of the net, net outcome of these things, the pre-tax income pressures, the balance sheet pressures. There's been a lot of work done by um, economists in the private sector and the government and academics. A good number that seems to come out of a lot of studies is if you take away a dollar in net worth permanently from households, they'll cut their consumption spending by about a nickel. If, that, if they think that's permanent. So if we take that hit to, uh, to, to the balance sheets of households and think it's going to persist for some period of time, that would suggest some you know, pretty sizable decline in consumption spending. And then the other thing is credit availability on the earlier question about, well, how the heck have households been increasing their consumption spending? Part of what's gone over the past 10, 20, 30 years is much easier access to credit. Financial innovation allowing you know, more access to credit cards, home equity uh, withdrawals, reverse mortgages, a lot of new financial tools that have allowed households to access uh, credit more easily, that's kind of going in reverse, right? Or at least it's, you know, credit lending standards have gotten much tighter. On some measures, they're not getting more tight, but they're tight, clearly, compared to what they were for households uh, a couple of years ago. And the other thing I don't know, kind of on this last question we had, is what I call the Bernie Madoff effect. How many households just say, in light of the crisis, and the fact that you had some of these financial scandals that just their sort of precautionary savings motive has gone up permanently. This is a really complicated set of forces and to, to, to predict. You, it's not that hard to understand the forces at play. And look, I could, tell you, I could tell you optimistic stories. I can tell you some more, you know, not so optimistic stories. I think if you look at the forecasts for once all is said and done for this calendar year from the government, you know, from different parts of the government, the Federal Reserve or the Congressional Budget Office, private sector forecasters, most people think that consumption compared to 08 will have fallen by about a couple hundred billion dollars in 09. Okay, that fall multiplied by 70% of GDP, that gets me, you know, a fall in GDP of something like that for the year. And looking out into 2010 and into 2011, you know, when I think about what the U.S. economy is going to be looking like overall, I want to know how households are doing, right? Yeah? So how much of the growth in GDP over the last two decades do you think was a function of credit expansion? And if that's stalled, where are the positives? Um, so clearly, I think we now know quite clearly some of the growth in consumption demand got pulled forward in calendar time thanks to easier access to credit, and in particular with mortgage equity withdrawals in 03, 04, 05, 06 even in the early parts of 07. Um, and, you know, think about cash for clunkers. I mean, it's a good example of that, right? I mean, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're going to use fiscal incentives to boost one particular, you know, dur durable good for people to buy, guess what? They go out and pull it forward in time. A lot of people might have been thinking about buying a car now or early next year. They went out and bought it at, at, when that program window was open. And then the window closed and automobile sales fell off the table again. And I'll, uh, I'm intimating, I, I, that wasn't my favorite uh, fiscal policy choice by a long means. I think it was a bad idea. Um, so uh, I don't, I, I, um, 
Part of how I think in a broad sense the, the, this crisis arose, it, uh, I think it's become increasingly clear, is there's a lot of American households that were kind of living beyond their means. And I don't say that judgmentally, but observationally. And part of then how, how we could uh, sort of get more sustainable economic growth going is we don't need to, we ideally won't rely on consumption spending as much in the US. And it'll be a bit more balanced and we'll have more of our growth being driven by exports to the rest of the world by capital investment by companies. That will be a more balanced mix of aggregate demand that hopefully is going to grow incomes and grow the economy in a more sustainable way. Um, now, will we get that? I'm hopeful, but you know, we got some challenges there a little bit. Why do companies undertake a capital investment? Boy, if they got a sense of a good, good market opportunities at home or abroad, and they've also got some sense of certainty about the policy environment in which they're making those, those budgeting decisions, that tends to stimulate capital investment. But boy, you know, during this crisis, part of what's happened is a very sharp fall off in capital investment that's attenuated in the second quarter. Uh, but both for equipment and software and for structures, uh, we've seen this. Um, so why has CapEx fallen? You know, part of it is they're looking at their, their customers that are consumers, that are American households for some companies. Some of it is folks looking abroad at those markets. They're seeing big drop off in, in other economies. Um, and I hear this time and again, I'm sure many of you in this room would agree, but with the work I do with companies in the past many months, I can't tell you how many executives and boards say that they've, they have not seen the degree of kind of policy uncertainty ever this high. They talk about the uncertainty about regulations and laws in the United States in particular, other countries as well, but over things like tax, personal tax and corporate tax, Compensation, capital markets regulation, healthcare regulation, competition policy, energy policy, all those things, some of which are conversations I think that are important and good to have, but the reality is the more, the more those conversations persist without clear policy choices, and the more they kind of interact with each other, the more a lot of companies hold back on their capital investment spending. Um, and I'll, so that's some thoughts on capital investment. If you look to the rest of the world, um, here again, there's reason for optimism, given that calendar time has moved on. As deep as the recession was in the United States, in many other countries around the world, it was much deeper. So these here, I have some numbers for the 16 countries that use the euro, the United Kingdom and Japan. Uh, these numbers for Q4 of last year and the first two quarters of 2009, the convention of other countries is they do not annualize their uh, changes in GDP quarter by quarter. So to compare these numbers to the ones we were looking at for the US, you got to multiply everything by four. So in, Q in the first quarter of this year, the, the, the Eurozone was contracting at an annualized rate of 10%, almost 10% in the UK, something like 13% annualized rate of contraction in Japan, which is still the second largest economy in the world. So this really was, as, as severe as it's been in the United States, it's been in many other advanced countries even more severe. But what's great is that it's, it's moderating quite, quite quickly. Um, and that's, that's reason for hope. Another good thing that's hopeful is many middle and low income countries, and I'll highlight China and, Japan, or China and, and uh, India, um, you know, we'd all love to have their problems of they're still growing but at much slower rates. So the Chinese economy grew by 13% in 2007. For 2009, it's projected they're going to grow in, at probably something like 8%. You know, we'd all love to have that problem of growing at just 8%. Um, but there we are. But for the world, that's a very good thing. Because many of these middle and low income countries, in principle, can provide market opportunities for a lot of businesses based in the US and elsewhere. That's where revenue growth and top line growth to try to support jobs and other things could, in principle, come from. Um, so the current forecast for the world, again, this moderation that's happened in the U.S., we see in a lot of other countries, and that's great. And hopefully that's going to kind of sustain itself. Um, and somebody asked earlier, comparing it to the Depression, um, here's a few slides, actually. There's a couple of economic historians that have put together a couple of, uh, set of lovely slides you can get online, Barry Eichengreen and, and Kevin O'Rourke. So what I'm going to show us are a few pictures comparing uh, uh, how the re global recession has looked now compared to during the Great Depression. So what they did was they made these neat charts where they lined them up in calendar time and they scroll things out month by month, OK? So for the next few slides, blue is the Great Depression. And, and the Great Depression, kind of late 1929, is when they kind of dated the peak of that business cycle. And then there came the Great Depression for a few years until it troughed out, about uh, four years almost. Um, and then in red is, the, is, the, is the, uh, the current world recession, which on a lot of measures, world economic activity peaked in April of 2008. 
So the red lines in calendar time start in April of, of 2008. So what you see is, again, the severity of the drop-off over the first kind of year, roughly, and, and most of these lines go through that last line here for the red is, is as of September. So they try to get data through September, uh, which is the most current they can. And there's a bunch of measurement things, how you aggregate different countries. Just don't worry about it. It's, 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 um, it's done pretty well. So what you see is, um, you know, this first year of the recession looked a lot like the Great Depression, but it's turned in a way that it didn't during the Great Depression. So world industrial output, that's output of manufacturing and utilities, that's stabilizing, which is great. Um, here's world trade flows. Again, the drop-off in trade it was, was much more severe. These are indexes. Sorry, I should have said both these things are kind of indexes. So world, world industrial output falling by about 10% and then starting to tick back up. World trade flows falling by almost 20% now but stabilizing, and it looks like maybe even starting to tick back up. That's encouraging. Notice that fall is deeper than it was during the Great Depression, but partly because countries are so much more integrated now than they were back then. Um, here's world equity markets, some measure of kind of world stock prices averaged across a lot of major markets. Uh, what you see now, you know, here's March, and then this dramatic uh, rebound uh, in, in global equity prices. Again, still a fair bit below where they were at the peak uh, some 18 months ago. Um, and we could have a conversation about how well-priced or you know, how, how that looks, how sustainable the bounce in equities is. And why is it different? A big reason that it's different now in the United States and other countries uh, compared to during the Great Depression is how uh, actively governments have been intervening. Right? It's been the active intervention by central banks. So here's a measure of that, which is the target policy interest rates of a collection of, I think it's like 10 major central banks around the world. And as I think a lot of you might know, part of what a big policy error of the Great Depression was central banks did not they, they, they held pretty tight on monetary policy throughout much of the Great Depression. Whereas now, quite literally, the US Fed and the, and, the, and the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England have printed out of thin air trillions and trillions of dollars. Yeah, yeah Charles. Yeah, can we go back to that chart with equity shift? Yep. I mean, uh, look at the, uh, the slope of the red line, red curve, is yep. enormous. I mean, it's an enormous drop. Yep. Uh, the other one's obviously down, but it's a very quick, enormous drop, and then a kick up. Uh, doesn't that? How do you how do you read that relative to your your uh, signs at this point? But it's an enormous drop. More no, it uh, it is so. A great question. I'm, uh, so I'll say two things. One is. Uh, not knowing the good answer to this is why my wife is the house accountant and I'm the house trash and recycling guy. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, another, uh, so a couple thoughts. Another is, um, more, more practically, if I look at the US on most of the kind of price earnings indicators that people construct, PE ratios for the S&P 500 look to be at about 20 or 21 right now in the United States. Uh, and, and the kind of mini decade average was about 16 is the number that I always carry around in my head, which would suggest some of that looks maybe a little ahead of itself. Um, it could have been. No, no. This is a great question. And more generally, one of the things to keep in mind is I, I know we all have a million and one questions about the crisis and the recession and things. Um, and that sounds like an average tower academic, but understanding these things is going to take a lot of years. You know what I mean? It's going to take a lot of years, more data, just calendar time to take along to see some of the adjustments. Um, and, and I will say, for those of you here, right, part of the enriching weekend we've got Sunday morning, there's going to be a panel on the, and more focus on the capital markets crisis piece as well. Um, I think a couple, of, a couple of generous alums with their time, and, and uh, John Llewellyn and, and uh, Bob Hansen, a couple of my colleagues, are going to talk about some of this stuff. We can come back to it. Uh, but again, part of the rebound, now some people will also say, though, Charlie, so the other thing is, some people say, well, when central banks print trillions of dollars, it's got to go somewhere. So that's part of where, uh, I'm sorry, I'm meaning here. It's part of what we don't know. But again, why, why there seems to have been the moderation in activity, it has a lot to do with very activist monetary policy and very activist fiscal policy. Right? Monetary policy is printing money out of thin air and using it to do things with your balance sheet when you're a central bank. And then governments cutting taxes and increasing spending and borrowing to do that. 
right? And here's measures of fiscal deficits as a share of GDP for uh, a set of, I think it was like uh, 10 or 15 kind of advanced countries during the Depression versus now. And you just see these much deeper uh, declines in the fiscal position of countries as they've cut taxes more and have gone out and spent a lot more. And they're borrowing to do that. Yes? You see that uh, central banks and governments reacted very aggressively, as you said, and, and flooded the market with liquidity. Yep. What would your, out, your outlook be in their ability to reverse struggling when the time comes? Essentially, yeah, great uh, question. Can I come to that in a couple minutes? I got a slide on it in like two minutes. But just to give us a sense of the, you know, how, how the world looks and how we look compared to the Depression, right? And, and again, boy, it could have been a lot worse, right? And, and a short answer I'll give right now is, and you know, full disclosure, you know, I've worked with Chairman Bernanke when he was at CEA before he went to the Fed. Boy, a lot of the central banks, they were, it was crisis management, and, and they were scared, and they were uncertain, and... Um, I think they made a lot of excellent policy choices to try to, you know, the fact that we don't have unemployment at 20% right now, as difficult as it is, is 9.8%, is in part because of these interventions. In part. Not entirely, but in, in big part. And, but on your good question, I'll come to in a minute, is, okay, now what do we do? Right? That's kind of a, a challenge. So what do we do? Well, governments, again, they can do, they've done, and we can, I want to spend a little bit more time before we... Uh, 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 talking about kind of the, the intersection between the government policy choices and what businesses are doing. Uh, let's spend a minute on fiscal policy. So again, the other piece of aggregate demand is government spending. So that was, uh, uh, in the United States, that's 20% of GDP about. But careful, remember, government spending is state and local governments as well as the federal government. And when you talk about government demand uh, in terms of buying new goods and services, two-thirds of that is state and local governments, not the federal government. So the federal government, in terms of its buying new goods and services, that's only about a third of total G, government demand. Two-thirds of it is state and local governments. And these state and local governments, uh, they all, say all the states but Vermont, 49 of the 50 US states, uh, by constitution or legislation, have to run balanced budgets. So the challenge there is, as their tax revenues uh, uh, go down a lot, as they have been with the pressure of the recession, they have to cut spending. At the federal level, only about $1 trillion of federal spending is, 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 is supporting aggregate demand in terms of buying newly produced goods and services. Only about a $1 trillion, of which about $700 billion is, is, de, is the defense budget, defense spending. Most of what the federal government does is transfer payments, you know, collecting taxes and, and transferring to someone else. I'm not, that's not bad. I'm just saying, but just keep in mind that most of what the government does, especially Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, is, is entitlement payments. So if we think about the role of government in supporting uh, the, the upturn in the economy, careful, I care a lot more about state and local governments than I do the federal government. And here, you know, the numbers you see coming in um, of, of the plunge in state tax revenues, year over year they fell 17% if you add up all the 50 states in the second quarter of this year. That's a force that's going to be there for a while. So, uh, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of all the parts of the stimulus package, but one of the pieces I did like actually was transfers from the federal government to state and local governments to try to help fill in the hole in education budgets and other things. Um, so governments have been uh, 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 doing a lot of spending and a lot of borrowing to pay for that as they cut taxes and increase spending. So the, one of the challenges, we'll get to monetary in the next slide, the challenge for fiscal policy is how do we pay for this? Um, the numbers right now that are coming out in, the, in recent days and weeks, uh, the 2009 federal budget deficit in the United States will be about 10% of GDP or a little more. In dollars, it'll be $1.4, $1.6 trillion. We don't quite know yet because Treasury hasn't added up all the money. And it also depends, candidly, on how you account for some of the financial bailout money that gets spent. Because there's all these disagreements about whether you track it in gross outlays or whether you try to think in present value about, well, we're going to get some return on some of those investments to the extent that you think we're going to get return on different kinds of those investments. This is better than the forecast of four or five months ago. Four or five months ago, the consensus forecast was the deficit's going to be like $1.8 trillion of GDP. Now, one good thing was uh, that it fell to about one four to one six, largely because uh, the federal government had a $250 billion placeholder in there for more TARP-type transfers to the financial system. Um, they haven't had to do that. The financial system is stabilized. Now we can think about why that is. It's partly because of other implicit government support rather than cutting checks. It's been things like guaranteeing different debt instruments and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I've got here, you know, so what's happened, this is the gap between federal taxes and spending. Um, 
this is, you know, this is not hyperbole, but for a few years when the United States was engaged in world wars, especially World War II, we've never had a deficit this big as, as in our country, in the history of our country. So that's a big challenge to kind of fix, and it's also a big challenge because this now comes on what has long been known and discussed and somewhat worried about, this, this coming fiscal pressure from the aging of the U.S. population and the increase of health care costs and the pressures that places on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. So the current forecasts over the 10-year budget window are the right number to have in your head is that the best guess is the U.S. is going to run trillion dollar federal deficits for the next 10 years above and beyond this, this fiscal 09. Um, and I admit, as a baby buster, um, someone who's behind the demographic curve on this, gee, that's, a, that's an issue. Um, you know, we're not alone. <laughs> uh, many, many other countries face these fiscal pressures. Right, the UK right now, their, their, the, the depth of their recession, their, the finances, the public finances of the UK have been uh, just decimated. Um, but a lot of other countries face this challenge, right? Um, so ho I, I wish I could tell you every tax cut paid for itself. It doesn't. So somewhere we're going to have to have a conversation about what level of spending we want to support and, and, and to what extent we're going to think about finding sustainable sources of revenue to pay for that. So most of the numbers uh, that I'm quoting here from uh, a lot of government sources, they include in total outlays currently the expenditures for uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. How much do you know how much the U.S.? Uh, to, I shouldn't, I don't as I stand here. I can't remember exactly how much it is. Um, but I'll use that as an example of, uh, you know, not, not that those wars should be about dollars and cents, but I mean it's uh, entirely, but it's an issue of, you know, what are the spending priorities for the country going to be? Right? Part of why the deficit has gotten so huge is, is mostly this, is this large increase in spending as a share of GDP. It's gone up by about six plus percentage points in the past year. So we've got this much higher level of spending now. Taxes as a share of GDP have fallen a bit, but it's especially the increase in spending that has gotten the deficit so big right now. We may be okay with that, but you know, part of the question is whether debt markets, and in particular international debt markets, will allow the United States to continue this, uh, this rate of borrowing. Because on the question, unless households really increase their saving a lot, if households continue in the United States to be relatively low savers, on net, most of the financing of this deficit will have to come from borrowing from the rest of the world. And literally, like it has in recent years, from the, from the Bank of Japan, from the People's Bank of China, those two central banks, and from sovereign wealth funds. Those have been the main international pools of, of, of savings that the U.S. has tapped into. On monetary policy, right, the question is for the Fed and the ECB and the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England, they've undertaken these very dramatic policy interventions, um, quite literally because they're legally allowed to, by printing money out of thin air and then going out and, and buying things and expanding their balance sheets. So the Fed balance sheet before the crisis was about $850 billion. Today it's about $2 trillion. They've been up in the neighborhood of about $2.3 trillion for a handful of months. And now there's, a, there's an economic technical question of how you start to shrink your balance sheets for these central banks. And then I think even perhaps a little more challenging is the political economy question of are governments going to allow the central banks to kind of drain this liquidity and get back to more typical central banking at, at a timetable of their choosing. So the technical questions are somewhat hard to think about. So there's a story in the New York Times today the, uh, commenting how different uh, Federal Reserve Bank presidents and governors are saying very different things in public speeches about when they think the Fed needs to start raising its target interest rates and, and reducing the size of its balance sheet. And then I've got a quote here from Max Baucus, who's the chairman of the, of the committee in the U.S. Senate that oversees the Fed, where he says, um, the usual role of the Fed is the, the Fed. The role of the Fed has changed dramatically, and the usual defense of well, we shouldn't intrude on the integrity and independence of the Fed no longer applies. So that's, you know, this I, I think is, you know, I think a lot of people say what ch for Chairman Bernanke, not to presume, but if if he uh, hopefully as as I hope is confirmed by the Senate for another four-year term as chairman of the Fed. This will be the other big part of his legacy. The first part will have been you know, the economics of trying to address the crisis, and the second part will be the political economy to some extent of trying to handle the, 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 the exit from this, this uh, dramatic policy change. 
Um, and you know, there's a few other items on the to-do list, and hopefully we're going to make some good choices here, right? Um, we're, we're, the government, though, has gotten much more involved in the United States and many other countries in the business of doing business. So regulatory policy issues on financial markets, automobiles, uh, student lending, uh, insurance. The federal government is much more involved in these industries now, so that's kind of a, an open question. Uh, Ken French, who's on the faculty here with me at Tuck, Ken and I helped organize something called the Squam Lake Working Group on Financial Regulations. So it's a group of, we're a group of 15 academics from a lot of different schools. We've been writing a set of white papers that are, we're kind of circulating to say, hey, you know, here's some ideas on maybe good ways to do financial reform. Our view of the group, if I could distill it to one sentence, is we need to figure out a way to let banks go out of business like we let bowling alleys go out of business. Meaning, don't have me so large and interconnected that we, we have to support them with taxpayer dollars. They kind of need to be allowed to fail just like we let things fail in other industries. That's hard to do because typical bankruptcy procedures don't work for a lot of financial institutions. So you need a different set of resolution mechanisms for those organizations. Um, so we'll see on that. Uh, one thing that does worry me is we're becoming more protectionist. I, I, I said earlier, part of what we need to do is sell more stuff to the rest of the world, but in policy, we are becoming much more closed off to the rest of the world. Uh, in the stimulus package earlier this year was slipped in a two-page bill called the Employ American Workers Act, which made it much harder for hundreds of U.S. financial companies to hire uh, skilled foreign nationals using the H-1B visa program. Several Tuck students that had received job offers from top U.S. banks got those job offers revoked because they were foreign nationals. So Dean Danos and Bob Hansen and I wrote not bad on that in the journal. Um, and I, you know, more recently, we've initiated, uh, let's call it a trade disagreement with China when uh, the president decided to levy uh, uh, tariffs, punitive tariff against uh, imports into the United States of tires coming from China. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, and then there's a set of these kind of structural problems. The income inequality is one that I'd put on that list that I showed us a minute ago. But issues of health and education and infrastructure. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that some of these things have been around for a long time and we need to address them. And my summary statistic I'll give us here is the high school graduation rate in the year I was born uh, was 77.1%. The most recent year of data that we've got on this is actually still just 2005. But you know what the high school graduation rate was in the United States that year? 74.9%. It's, it's, been, it's been stagnant for 40 years. And you see that in college completion rates for males in particular. So the aggregate college completion rate in the U.S. has barely ticked up over those 40 years, in large part because of, um, because of rising female educational attainment at, at the college level. So, th you know, there's a set of challenges, and, and, and I don't know, look, despite what my mother thinks, I don't know all the answers to these challenges, <laughs> but hopefully as a country we're going to start to kind of have a, a more complete more kind of empirical uh, and, and a sort of a more uh, uh, thorough policy conversation on some of these things that resolves the uncertainty. Because I come back to that fact about how we've got fewer private sector jobs today than we did a decade ago. The challenge, I think, is how you give our companies in the US, little and big, entrepreneurial, uh, long standing, more of an incentive to understand some of the environment they're going to be working in here so they've got more of an incentive to go out and hire people. I'm hopeful we'll do that. Um, and, you know, the rest of the world's watching. Here's the value of the dollar. This is an index from 1973 through to today. Uh, a big article in the Wall Street Journal today talking about how the dollar, the, the rate of dollar depreciation is picking up again. You saw it uh, uh, be offset for a few months during the crisis as a lot of investors around the world continue to seek U.S. Treasuries as that safe world asset, but that's changing again. Um, so where's the economy going to go in the near term? People use these alphabet metaphors. Right? So a V-shaped recovery, a strong recovery, that'd be great. You know, to that, have that happen, though, I think you really got to see some sharp pickup in capital, exports and, uh, capital investment and exports and consumption demand to some extent. Um, you know, if, if you asked me to guess on one letter, I'd probably be more in the L camp of not strong growth in capital exports and capital investment and exports and consumption. I'm hopeful we don't have this W, this dip down in a recession again. Um, but that narrative, I think, would depend in part on consumers really feeling a little more uncertain. Um, and be a little careful here. You know, this, this crisis had a lot to do, the like financial crisis is a big part of why we're in a recession. Getting out of, of recessions after financial crises tends to take a bit longer, and it's a little bit harder uh, than ones where central banks purposely drive up interest rates and then lower them back down. There was a hand.
how does this compare to other recessionary markets where you actually did find a V-shaped recovery? Yeah, a great question. I, I just said it kind of fast. I'll say it once more. Most recessions in the United States over the 20th century, especially after World War II, were because the Fed got worried about rising inflation. They, on purpose, started raising interest rates a lot. And that made it harder for companies to borrow for CapEx, made it harder for consumers to borrow in, in consumption demand. And you saw falls, or slowdowns at least, in consumption, especially capital investment, and you had a recession. And then the recession ended when the central bank started to lower interest rates again. So it was, most of our recessions have been kind of purposefully um, uh, uh, brought about by the Fed because of their dual mandate to keep an eye on price stability. They had to, with rising price inflation, uh, try to slow the rate of money supply growth and raise interest rates. This one's different. I mean, again, the target Fed interest rate right now is at zero. So there's no notion of the Fed easing to get us out of the recession. We know what's got to be coming is, if anything, the Fed's got to be tightening monetary policy at some point before too long. That's why it's a little harder to know which of these letters to think is going to be the right one to forecast for what growth's going to be going forward. Right? But a lot of people, you know, I have, I have great confidence in the technical ability of our central bank and others. It's more kind of the challenge of the economic environment and the policy environment that you know, makes you worry a little bit more. So um, I've got a couple more slides of just pictures. You know, here was the automobile bailout hearing last November. Um, if you ask me, and I, I testified at this hearing, it was a lively hearing, let's say, because early on I realized I'm the only person here who's not supporting the automobiles bailout. Uh, so that was interesting. Um, you know, our, our president and Congress have managed bankruptcy filings. We now own the majority of General Motors, a minority stake in Chrysler. And the government, in different ways, is selecting executives, CEOs, boards of directors, R&D budgets, product mixes, labor contracts, global partners, and presence. I'm revealing my view on this. I don't think this is a great way to stimulate growth. Think about the reaction of the Hondas and the Toyotas and the Mercedes when they see this happening. This doesn't induce them to want to go out and do a lot of CapEx and hire a lot of people in the US. Um, and you know, we now own General Motors. And you know, here's kind of a telling anecdote. Today in the news is a conversation that looks like they've finalized the sale of the Hummer brand as they try to right size General Motors and salvage something out of that company um, to an industrial company based in China. Right? And they may well turn it around. Right? So, um, and here was the AIG uh, 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 bonuses hearing at, in House Financial Services in, in, uh, in, in March. This gentleman came out of retirement to work for a dollar a year. Um, it's been, I think, <laughs> perhaps not the time that he imagined. Uh, but the House, after these hearings, overwhelmingly voted uh, for an ex post marginal tax rate of 90% on the earnings of thousands of finance workers and bankers in the US. Now, the Senate hasn't moved on that, and they probably won't at this point, but again, I don't think that's a great way to get out of the kind of some of the challenges that we're in right now. Here was some of the congressional leadership last September uh, after the day. Remember the day when finally the, they put to the House of Representatives the vote on the initial TARP legislation, the $750 billion, and Congress voted it down. And I just think remember sitting here with Tuck colleagues. I did some TV earlier that day, and I walked back up here to Tuck from the studio that Dartmouth has, and somebody came in my office and said, are you watching the vote? And I said, well, no. You know, everybody kind of thinks that the House is going to vote it up. And, that, and it became clear as the t time was ticking along, the House was going to vote it down. And what happened to global markets as that happened? They crashed. Equities, everywhere, just asset prices started to fall minute by minute as people realized the House of Representatives was going to vote this down. Now, this isn't a partisan statement. A bunch of Republicans and Democrats voted against it. Um, the next day and in the coming few days, a lot of commentators said, wow, part of what's so unsure in the world is that, wow, even the US government really doesn't know quite what to do. And the Financial Times ran a big analysis story the next day talking about perhaps this is the decline of the American economic empire. And they ran the story, and they had this picture, and I read the story, and then I looked at the picture. And then I said, huh, you know, you know if anything about geography on the, on the Washington, D.C. mall? Y yeah, you're on the Lincoln Memorial steps looking down the mall to the Capitol. You're actually looking east, not west. So this is sunrise, not sunset. <laughs> so I sent off an email to some of the editors of the FTN now saying, by the way, um, you know, don't be so dour. Um, so I'll close on that thought. You know, um, things are better in, in a cyclical sense. It's not difficult to think we're going to get some decent economic, slow but positive economic growth, definitely in this quarter, hopefully going forward. But again, a big challenge is what's going to be the set of things on, in aggregate demand that induces companies to hire more people? In my mind, again, I come back to that being a really central question. 
Beyond that, there's some really big challenges that our country and other countries face. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I welcome you back to Tuck, and I know it's a, a, a weekend of joy in many ways. That's just kind of where the world is, right? And I wish it were different. Um, but the good thing is, when I ask the question where the leadership's going to come from, remember, what, part of what we do at Tuck is try to, in the, with our students in the MBA program, create the leaders of tomorrow who are going to help us fix all this. Because it's fixable. A lot of these things can be addressed. It's just going to take some focus and some attention, in some ways some time. Um, and hopefully we'll figure it all out. But that's, that's some of my reflections on where we are. And as I said, it's, it's great to see so many people back here. And thanks for coming. And I ran over Sorry Day by a little bit of time. I'm happy to take any other questions to the group or if you want to come up afterwards. But thanks. Thank you very much, Matt. That was great. You're dynamic. You're informative. Thanks. You are approachable. This is the kind of teaching that happens in the Tuck classroom. I'll ask you all to think about what went into this presentation, the amount of time, the amount of research and also Matt's teaching style. That's really what we're trying to focus on um, in terms of bringing out to our faculty here at Tuck. And I think uh, Dean Danos has been very successful. And we're very appreciative that you're here with us and spending the time with us. Thank you so much, Thank Matt. You. It's great. I do have something for you. Maybe you can share this with your wife. Oh, sure. And, and, uh, she does the house accounts. And when she does the house accounts and balances ah, the yes, checkbook. We'll and, uh, and thank her for sharing you with us. Good. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you.